So it's now my pleasure to introduce our first change maker of the evening, Sarayu Yirao. And Sarayu is a PhD student in the Department of Civil Engineering working with Professor Subhashis Goshal um, in the Benedek Environmental Engineering Laboratories. Sarayu is going to tell us tonight about how nanomaterials can improve technologies for sustainability, but how they can also have adverse effects on our environment and ecosystems. And she's going to tell us about her research in order to improve measurement techniques for nanomaterials in the environment so that we can assess their fate, their potential impacts, and design improved materials that can uh, lead to more sustainable technologies. So, Sarayu, please. Thanks. I would like to describe a field in which little has been done but in which an enormous amount can be done in principle. What I want to talk about is the problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. There's plenty of room at the bottom. This was a very famous lecture by Richard Feynman in the year 1959, where the concept of nanotechnology was first conceived. What you see here is a fourth century artifact, the Lycurgus cup. What is so special about this cup? This cup is green and opaque under reflected light, red and transparent under transmitted light. What is this ancient sorcery? When this cup was being made, it was accidentally contaminated with minute silver and gold dust particles. These dust particles happen to be what we use to such a large extent today in our products and applications called nanoparticles. If you had to imagine one nanoparticle that was one nanometer big, take a strand of your hair, divide it 80,000 times, and that will give you one nanometer. Due to their extremely small size, nanomaterials are being incorporated into many products and applications. How many of us go through our day using sunscreens, cosmetics, toothpastes, electronic items? All of us, right? That's what I thought. Silver nanoparticles, for example, are used for their antimicrobial properties in many products. They're used in food packaging, in clothes, in medical dressings, and even in washing machines. This is just one example. Nanomaterials are also used in a wide variety of environmental applications like oil spill cleanups, environmental remediation, and even water treatment. Due to this, the global market for nanotechnology is now booming. In 2009, the global market was $254 billion. In just less than four years from now, the market is predicted to reach $3 trillion. That's approximately 12 times an increase in just about 10 years. Predictions and trends for growth and expansion are constantly going to be made. Having said that, we are the future generation, and our generation is probably going to be most affected by this technology for the better or for worse. So let's look at one such prediction that was done in 2010. What you see on your left are the top recognized nanoparticles that have been incorporated into consumer products and applications. And on your right, you see the different sinks where nanoparticles could eventually end up. As you can see from this figure, about 80% of nanoparticles end up in landfills. A small but significant amount do end up in soil and water systems as well. Upon entering the environment, these nanoparticles are bound to have interactions with organisms. It is very important for us to study these nanomaterial biological interactions so that we're able to determine their exposure and toxicity. There has been evidence that nanoparticles have been found to have ill effects on certain microorganisms and organisms. What you see here is the gills of a rainbow trout. And you can see with exposure and with no exposure, there's such a big difference. 
with an exposure of 500 micrograms per liter of titanium dioxide nanoparticles, the gills had a mucus lining membrane damage and edema. In another study, where they looked at the effect of nanomaterials or in biosolids on the effect of plant growth, they found that these nanomaterials caused a change in the soil microorganisms, and due to this, the plants had stunted growth. The point I'm trying to make here is that nanomaterials have a wide variety of applications that make a better world. But at the same time, they're not 100% safe and they are causing ill effects as shown in these studies. Nanotechnology has the potential to provide us with cost-effective and efficient solutions for sustainable infrastructure, clean drinking water, and food safety. For example, nanoscale manufacturing can provide us with means for sustainable development where we use lesser materials, lesser energy, lesser water, and produce lesser wastes. All these applications are very important for a sustainable nano future. But I'd like to stop here and ask a question. What happens to these nanomaterials once the products are done being used? Let's all think about this together for a second. For example, we have our cosmetics, toothpastes that eventually get washed out and go into our sinks and then the wastewater treatment plant. When we're talking about bigger products like electronic items and food packaging, these end up in landfills. All of these are eventually ending up in one environmental compartment or the other. This is where my research comes in. We are trying to find the fate and behavior of these released nanoparticles from these products and applications. In order to do so, we have to develop techniques that can characterize these nanoparticles at low concentrations or environmentally relevant concentrations. Why do I pause here? It's because there have been studies on toxicity and fate of nanomaterials done at higher concentrations. But are these studies relevant? Is that what we're exactly going to see in the environment? Through my research, we really hope to look at the fate and behavior of these nanomaterials at low environmentally relevant concentrations. This, in turn, is going to determine if we need to design for more stability, if we need to change the way we're designing these nanomaterials, if we have to incorporate fewer nanomaterials in our products so that there are, there's lesser release at the end. And all these together is going to affect the applications and their use in sustainability. I am now going to go into more details of my research and tell you how I'm trying to find the missing link for a sustainable nano future. What you see here is a model aquatic environment and the small black dots are the engineered nanoparticles. They can go through a wide variety of processes. For example, they can come up together and homoaggregate. Some metallic nanoparticles can dissolve. Some of them can undergo surface transformation under the prevailing aquatic chemistries. And some nanomaterials can interact with colloids and bacteria and heteroaggregate. Each of these processes are very important to study because they are all going to ultimately tell us the fate and bioavailability of these nanomaterials. Or in other words, we are going to find out how available these nanomaterials are upon release for uptake by microorganisms and other bigger organisms. Now let's look at a more realistic situation. Imagine going to a river or a lake with a glass, getting a glass of water. What do you expect to find in it? There might be algae, there might be colloids, clay particles, bacteria, dead leaves, and maybe some nanoparticles. How am I going to pick out these nanoparticles, characterize them, and know their fate? It's like I'm trying to look for the needle in the haystack. And not only am I trying to look for the needle in the haystack, I'm trying to find its mass and size. 
And that's exactly what I'm trying to do through my research. Find the mass and size of the needle in the haystack. Or in other words, try and find methods to characterize and quantify these nanomaterials once they're released. In order to do that, the first step was to identify nanomaterials we could work with. So we chose titanium dioxide and silver nanoparticles, which are used quite commonly in personal care products. We then used existing novel techniques and optimized them to measure these at environmentally relevant concentrations. So these are the different techniques that we have used through our studies. Dynamic light scattering and nanotracking analysis are two light scattering techniques that give us information about the particle size. Field flow fractionation is a technique that is able to separate your particles according to size and give you information about their size distribution and their average size. And single particle inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, or SPICPMS, is a technique for metallic nanoparticles that can give us information about their size, the, the dissolved concentration, the number of nanoparticles present, and the particle size distribution. Each of these techniques are able to give us information about size. What they differ in is the concentration that is needed for detection. And as you can see, as we're going lower, we're reducing the detection limit. When I talk about light scattering of na a nanoparticle seen under light scattering, it may be hard for you to imagine what it looks like. So here is a short clip of how nanoparticles behave under laser light. They are undergoing a rapid motion called Brownian motion. Smaller the particles, more rapid the motion. To your right, you see field flow fractionation. This is a channel where particles are being separated according to size using a parabolic flow as well as a cross flow. So the first step was to optimize field flow fractionation to detect nanoparticles. So we use titanium dioxide nanoparticles here. What I really like about field flow fractionation is that it gives you the entire composition of your sample. You see everything that there is. The peak here gives you the average size, and the little red dots gives you the particle size distribution. The next step was to work with slightly more complex samples. So for this, we used three sizes of silver nanoparticles. We first ran them in SPICPMS, where we got a very nice size distribution. You may wonder what is wrong with this graph. It's representing all three sizes. But what we're not able to see is the exact composition of each of these sizes. And imagine going back to that reverse sample where, where you're trying to detect what nanoparticles are present and what compositions they're present in. This method lags behind. So what we next did was use these three nanoparticles to separate them using field flow fractionation. And here, we have three distinct peaks of 10, 30, and 100 nanometers. Now, going back to answering the river water question, it's great. So now, if we were able to find a method where we're able to first separate our particles according to size and then analyze them for composition and concentration, we would be able to get much more information. And that's exactly what we did. We collected the samples after analysis on field flow fractionation and ran them on SPICPMS. So first, we got the 10 nanometer particles, followed by the 30, and then the 100. We have now improved detection limits. We are able to go down to lower concentrations. We're getting information about particle size distributions. We're able to separate particles by fractions, and we have, we're getting information about their size. We are now one step closer to measuring that real water sample. Sometimes, when I get really involved in my experiments, in trying to get all my results, trying to get that perfect graph, more often than not, I forget what I'm ultimately trying to achieve. I forget the big picture. I then zoom out of the zone, and I think about how what I'm doing is going to make a difference in the world. 
There are currently 800 million people who don't have access to clean drinking water. That's one in nine who don't have access to clean drinking water. One third of the schools globally don't have portable water either. So you can imagine that's one third of the children that don't have access to clean drinking water. This is an example of how nanotechnology is providing us a solution to such a big problem. Here, they used ion nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles, embedded them in membranes to purify water to make it free from arsenic and microbes. It's a great solution and a very inexpensive solution for seven cents for 100 liters. As engineers, we're constantly creating products and processes to make the world a better place. As engineers, more so as human beings, we have to ensure we do this in a responsible fashion. If the science of the small and technology is actually providing us with solution for such a big problem like clean drinking water, we need to make sure it is done in a safe way. We need to make sure that it has no ill effects on human health or the environment. We need to do it for the world that believes in us. We need to do it for the people who believe in us. We need to do it for those children who believe in us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarayu. So we have time for a few questions. Um, if you'd like to go up to the mics on the side of the room, you're welcome to. If not, you can stand up and, uh, and we'll build. Soraya would be happy to take a question. Humus or yes. like that. that's a great question. That's exactly what my research is about. So we're trying to develop a technique where we're able to use field flow fractionation to differentiate between each of these fractions. So if we're able to optimize getting different fractions, so imagine like we're able to separate the small nanoparticles first, followed by the ones that have maybe coagulated or are attached to something else, and then analyze these fractions using single particle ICPMS, we would actually know a lot more. We would be able to tell how much of it is aggregating. Are major particles that are present actually aggregating, settling down, are they dissolving? I think we would get like a lot more information. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Sarayu again for her presentation.